In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Welcome to our online Eucharist for this, the 11th Sunday after Trinity. We shall endeavour in the parish of Chingford to keep on producing online services until at least the first Sunday of September. If you find this useful, then please do let us know, and then we will see what arrangements we can make for continuing the provision through the autumn. We pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. May the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins, heal and strengthen you by his Spirit, and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit. In the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. O God, you declare your almighty power most chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Mercifully grant to us such a measure of your grace that we, running the way of your commandments, may receive your gracious promises and be made partakers of your heavenly treasure. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of the Exodus. A new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses, for Pharaoh. The, but, but the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks they had imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him, but if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and became very strong. 
And because the, because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now, a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeves, reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughters of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she'd opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse it for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and she took him as her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. This is the word of the Lord. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. I appeal to you therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. This is the word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. When Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but to my father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You've got to move nimbly if you want to keep up with Jesus and his disciples, especially in this middle section of Matthew's Gospel. They're on the move, one step ahead of the religious, secular, and military authorities. 
Two weeks ago, we heard how Jesus and his disciples were in Galilee, in the north of the ancient land of the Hebrews and the northerly part of Roman Palestine. There Jesus fed the crowds and there he prayed by himself while the disciples got into trouble on the Sea of Galilee. Boats floundering, Jesus walking, Peter drowning. Last week they moved much further north, out of the Hebrew lands and into the Gentile lands of Phoenicia in the region of Tyre and Sidon. This week they've moved inland from those coastal cities into the highlands of Etruria and the headwaters of the Jordan at Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus has a question for his followers. Who do people say I am? Note that Jesus isn't asking what people are saying about him. He doesn't want to know how he's going down, asking about his viewing figures or his reach or the way in which people are buying into his brand. The disciples are not reporting on a meeting of the Jesus of Nazareth marketing campaign focus groups. Jesus wants to know who people think he is. We must be careful about this question. We might like to think that Jesus, asking questions about his identity and how it's perceived among the people of the land, is asking exactly the same sort of question as an individual might ask about her or his identity today. It isn't. There is an important difference here. For us, identity is an important factor, the most important factor perhaps, in self-identity, self-expression. It's something intimately connected with the truth about ourselves. To thine own self be true. What is true for you might not be true for me. Not so in Jesus' day or in Jesus' question. Here he is asking about truth, full stop. There is no relativism lurking behind Jesus' question. He is asking, have people really, finally, understood the truth? Of course, the crowds haven't. We can see that from the answers that the disciples give. They think you're a prophet, a heroic teacher of the faith come back from the recent past, John the Baptist, or the far past, Jeremiah, Elijah. Pretty impressive credentials, but still so wrong. It's what the philosophers call a category error, a fancy way of saying, you can't confuse apples with socks. They're two completely different things. You can't confuse Jesus with teachers of the truth. No matter how distinguished or heroic, he is the truth. You can't confuse Jesus with a prophet of the Lord. He is the Lord. So the crowds haven't understood the truth, have the disciples. Who do you say I am? Simon gets it. And again, thinking of the importance of tone, I always imagine Simon Peter giving his answer in a shrugging the shoulders, duh, it's so obvious kind of way. You're the Messiah, the son of the living God. What else could you be? Oh, Simon Peter the one who confessed Jesus as the Messiah and the one who denied he even knew Jesus as a human being. The one who in this week's gospel is described as the rock upon which the church will be built and in next week's gospel will be described as Satan himself, leading Jesus into temptation and being the father of lies. Isn't it interesting that Jesus addresses Peter here using his given name and his patronymic, his father name, Simon Bar Jonah. Earlier, Simon has been described as the son of John. Why does Jesus call him son of Jonah here? I think again, this shows Jesus's wry sense of humor. After all, what happened to the famous Jonah of the Hebrew scriptures? He famously was thrown out of a boat and sank deep beneath the waves until he was swallowed and then spat out by a great fish. What happened to Simon Peter in our gospel reading two weeks ago? He got out of a boat and sank deep beneath the waves until Jesus hauled him out and saved him. What happened to Jonah after he was rescued from the great fish? 
He was sent to the great city of Nineveh to preach God's repentance to its sinful citizens. And what will happen to Simon Peter? He will be sent to the great city of Rome to preach God's repentance and salvation to its sinful citizens. Jesus is slyly reminding Simon Peter of his lack of faith on and under the waters of the Galilee Sea. And he's subtly warning him of what will happen to him in the future. Jonah is on a mission, a mission from God, whether he wants to accept it or not. Oh, and he has to accept it. That's the way God works. And again, we see Jesus' humour in the way he calls Simon Peter the rock. All kinds of explanations for this name have been put forward, most involving punning. In Greek, the language in which the New Testament was written, there is a pun between Petros, Peter, and Petra, rock. We don't hear the pun in English, as the only word in which the pet root is commonly used is petrified, so frightened as to be turned into stone. Not, perhaps, the best image to apply to St. Peter the Apostle. Other explanations, biblical allusions, are also put forward. Is Jesus calling Simon Barjona Peter the Rock as a way of referring to the rock of Isaiah 51, in which Isaiah is told to look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug? Perhaps. Or perhaps it's another subtle reference back to Peter's battle between faith and faithfulness. A rock, when it is on land, is something solid and dependable, a firm base upon which to build. A rock, when it is on water, is the exact opposite. When on water, a rock will sink, like a stone. Is Jesus saying to Peter, there will be times when you face threats and challenges to your faithfulness, and then Peter, if you keep to your character as the rock, you will sink. You need to be strong, but you also need to learn how to swim through the waters of challenge and persecution. Then, and only then, with your eyes fixed upon me, your friend, your brother, your Lord, your Saviour, then you will be the disciple, the person that I have called you to be. No longer Simon, no longer son of Jonah, but Peter, who sees the truth of heaven. The only difference between the rock, which is the foundation of all, and the rock, which sinks beneath the waves, is grace, the loving embrace of God in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. Peter, the apostle, could be both foundation and sinker. Like him, too, through grace, we can be built into the walls of the heavenly city. We, too, can be part of the kingdom of heaven. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We affirm our faith in the words of the Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead 
and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church which Christ has built and for the world which he has saved. Preserve your church in strength and stability by your promise that no evil shall prevail against it. Make its members zealous in their callings to work in all things according to your will. Lord, in your mercy. Give to all people the desire to work together for good. As they recognise their calling, may each come to know Christ as the Son of God. Lord, in your mercy. Bless us in our daily work and bless those who work with us. Use in your service the abilities of all who live and work in this community. Grant wisdom and discernment to those who are called to special responsibility. Strengthen with hope those who think themselves of no worth or who live under the pain of physical or mental illness. Give them light to understand their part in your purpose and grace to fulfil it and the comfort of the presence of Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. We commend those who have died in the faith of Christ, true to the church which he built. Keep us constant in the same faith now and at the last. Rejoicing in our fellowship with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Saint Peter, Saint Paul and all the saints, we commend ourselves and the whole world to your unfailing love. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are the body of Christ. In one spirit we are all baptised into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendour and the majesty, for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right. It is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise, Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. For he is your living word. Through him you have created all things from the beginning and formed us in your own image. Through him you have freed us from the slavery of sin, giving him to be born of a woman and to die upon the cross. You raised him from the dead and exalted him to your right hand on high. Through him you have sent upon us your holy and life-giving spirit and made us a people for your own possession. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, 
these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood. Who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it, gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for the coming of your kingdom. And with this bread and this cup, we make the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Lord. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Accept through him, our great high priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts, in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power be yours for ever and ever. Amen. Let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, grant us peace. God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy, Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Let us pray. Lord of all mercy, we, your faithful people, have celebrated that one true sacrifice which takes away our sins and brings pardon and peace. By our communion, keep us firm on the foundation of the gospel and preserve us from all sin through Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray together, Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. 
send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Christ, who has nourished us with himself, the living bread, make you one in praise and love and raise you up at the last day. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God.